Not live yet. Mike, you're getting ready. Would you please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice. So if anyone wishes to report or photograph the meeting, they must first notify the chair who will then inform the public per order of the Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, July 2010, such audio or video may not interfere with the meeting. Let's have a roll call. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Here again. Here. Yeah. The Marlin? Here. And um, first we have the public comment. Sarah Hartley. Sarah, could you come up to the podium, please? Maybe. <laughs> All right, good evening. My name is Sarah Hartley. Uh, I have been a history teacher here for 13 years, uh, and I'm also a resident of New Bedford. Um, I am just here to follow up on conversations that and comments that my colleagues and I made in June. Um, since the last time uh, I stood before you in June, neither I nor any of my colleagues have heard from the committee members regarding our concerns. When we first raised our concerns about the school's parental leave policy, we were encouraged to discuss the matter with administration and human resources because they were the experts. We did just that. Uh, we were told that although they were open to discussions, uh, they would not be addressing the problems. When that occurred, we came back to you, uh, the school committee, to clarify for you how we had been manipulated in the process of establishing policy for parental leave. Then we heard nothing. That single individual has asked for more information or clarification. My question for the committee is as follows. How would you react to your administration or your teachers refusing to respond to a difficult parent, uh, email, or a difficult situation with the administration? Would you tolerate us ignoring people? And I don't think you would, and it's not, as it is not professional. As I tell my students, not making a choice, not saying something, is still saying something, and silence speaks volumes. We would appreciate a resolution to this conversation. If that means you refuse to discuss this with us and hold the administration administration accountable, that is fine. We would simply appreciate the courtesy of being able this much. Thank you. Uh, those comments will be put on record. Um, I just want to clarify for everyone, we really should be looking at public comment that's pertaining to something on the agenda at the current meeting. So I think that'll be a, a little bit of a change going forward from what the practice has been in the past. Um, I know that we have discussed this as a committee. And I think Mr. Watson, if we're able to set up a meeting with Whoever the sure. people are involved, and maybe a committee member can do absolutely that to be sure that that meeting takes cool. place and that there's some kind of resolution. And absolutely, do that. Yep, I'll work with Dr. Marlin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. last year was uh, there was a lot going on, and we got there, and we've got all these contracts now, so that's awesome. And I think the idea of putting together the committee, be perfect. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hartley. Okay, so, and um, do I have a motion to accept the minutes of September 13th? The motion we accept the minutes of the September 13th meeting as presented. Second. second. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, to put on record that um, they have read the minutes and they agree 
um, <laughs> approval of bills, please. For uh, 2303. Is that a motion? Okay, motion that we need a warrant. Second. Okay. And um, agreement? Aye. Opposed? MCAS presentation, our favorite. <laughs> I'm talking this way and you're that way. It's okay. Good evening, everyone. So we have the 2022 NCAS and accountability results for Radio Dental Road Tech. And as you uh, look at your, at your packet, just a couple of things that I think we need to highlight uh, as we look at the 2022 MCAS results as well as the accountability report. So there are a couple of changes that have happened since the last time that we made a presentation. Uh, both on MCAS and accountability due to COVID and some of the changes that the Department of Ed has, has made. In previous reports that we shared with you folks, the Department of Ed calculated the accountability report based on what they call CPI, which is Composite Performance Index, for both English, Math, and Science, which basically was awarding points for students that fit into a certain um, scoring category. Students that scored between the 200 and the 208 on the old test received zero points, 210 to 218 received 25, so on and so forth. They then tallied all those points divided by the total number of students that took the test, and then would equal the CPI. That is now gone. They are no longer using that calculation. What they are using is the average scaled score for each of the three tests, English, math, and science, since they have shifted the new standard and the new scale score of 440 to 560. And we should not compare uh, any of those numbers to the old seal because they all necessarily correlate. The Department of Data reports out for students with different achievement levels. Exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, partially meeting expectations, and not meeting expectations. So that is a change since the last time that you know, we were experimenting on uh, both NCAS and accountability. Also, since the last time that we did one of these presentations, the science test is totally different. And it should not be compared to previous results. They are a new set of standards as well as a new way of testing kids. Students now take the MCAS, all three subject areas, on the computer. Everything is computer-based, and science is now based on the new standards. So you really can't compare the old results to the new. They, they're just totally different. So in essence, what this does in 2022, the results in 2022, is it sets for both us and the department that a brand new baseline as we move forward. So we should really look at 2022 and compare it back to 2019 when, when uh, last Saturday we actually reported report on not only MCAS but accountability. So this kind of creates a brand new baseline going forward. You will see some comparisons as we look at student growth compared to previous years and uh, elaborate on that a little bit. So on the next slide, uh, one, and this slide actually comes right from the department that these are not in numbers, they are uh, state numbers across the board. Sue Madison, he is a, continues to be a challenge, not only for us here at Great Internet, Votech, but certainly across the Commonwealth. The numbers you see there are across the state, and pretty much as we look back to the previous two, two and a half years, uh, students have lost an awful lot of instructional time, both due to when we went remote, uh, we went partially remote and partially in school, as well as students continue to uh, take more days off from school, if you will, because student tests positive. Uh, they let us know, obviously, we encourage the students to stay home and so forth. So as you look at these numbers, 
uh, you'll notice that kids have missed an awful lot of days over the previous uh, couple of years. So we'll keep that on the back of our minds as we go through this. On the next slide, you will actually see the way that the state now reports uh, student performance across all three tests and subject areas. So what we did is we took a combination of the students that are at meeting expectations and exceeding expectations because we obviously want to meet or exceed state standards. There are two columns. The first column you'll notice says state. That is a combination of meet and exceeds across uh, the, the Commonwealth. And in this particular case, in ELA, 58% of all students in the Commonwealth either met or exceeded expectations on the English test. To the right of that, you will notice that GMBBT, combination of meets and exceeds, we are at 56%. So we are at a differential of minus 2% compared to the state for all students. That's based on the roughly 545 students that took the English test. Just as important, looking at the opposite end of that scale, are the percentage of students not meeting expectations. Those will be students that in the future will not be meeting the graduation requirement. You will notice that at the state, for all students in English, 8% of the students are not meeting expectations. Here at Voltec, that percentage has happened. We are at 4%. That is certainly something that should be celebrated. So when we compare our kids not meeting expectations to students across the Commonwealth, we are at 4% state is at 80. And what you'll notice for each of the lines below that are each of the subgroups that the Department of Ed also reports out of. So that second line meets and exceeds expectations, students that are in the high needs category. High needs is any combination of a low income student, student with disabilities, or an English learner. Any of those three. Uh, would deem a student to be a high needs student. That is actually our largest population in the uh, in the school. Across the state, 38% of high needs students met or exceeded their expectations. You will notice that in Great Invent and Vote Ed, 46% of the students are either at meets or exceeds, which is actually a positive of 8%. We are actually, our high needs students are actually outperforming high needs students across the state in the LA. When you look again at the not meeting expectations, just like we looked at the all students, at the state level, 14% of the students are not meeting expectations at Greater uh, Bedford Road Tech, 5% of the students are not meeting expectations. So we are 9% below the state level. That column on the right, we want to be a negative because we are below the state when it comes to not meeting expectations. Column on the left, we obviously prefer to be on the plus side. Breaking those students something in high needs looking exclusively at low income students. At the state level, 39% are meeting or exceeding expectations. Here in Vogue Deck, it is 50%. We are 11 percentage points above the state level. When you look at not meeting expectations, the state is at 26% of low income students not meeting expectations. We are at 22. So we are below the state by 4%. Again, that is another area that certainly uh, we need to uh, take notice of because we are not performing the state at that point. Students with disabilities, 20% of the students are meeting and exceeding expectations. Here at Voltec, it is 18%. We are at a minus two and meeting um, and exceeding expectations. I think more importantly, as we look at some of the disabilities, not many expectations across the state is 26%. We are at 22, so we are below the state by 4%. English learners and former English learners, these are students that have tested out the ESL program. Combination of those two students, we are actually dead even with the state. Both the state and Great Bethel Vote Debt, we are at 21% for median and exceeding expectations. When we look at not meeting expectations, and the other students take the exact same test in the English language and arts as any other student, across the state, 30% of the students are not meeting expectations. 
Your local PEC net percentage is 8%. We are below the state by 22. When we look at African American students, 41% of the students across the state are meeting or exceeding. You are bringing that the vote that is 42%. We are outperforming the state by 1%. That's a move. When we look at not meeting expectations, the state is at 13% for African American students. We are at 4 So we are at a negative of 9, 9 percentage points. Looking at Hispanic Latino students, state is at 38 percent. We are at 49 percent for meeting and exceeding, a positive 11 percentage points. And when we look at not meeting expectations, 17 percent of Hispanic Latino students have not meeting expectations. Here are agreed that the tech is 5 percent. Again, we are below the state by 12 percent. So if you look at that, English language arts are not many expectations. Every one of those lines, we are below the state when it comes to not being expectations, which is something that I think uh, needs to be applauded, needs to be recognized and applauded for all the hard work that our staff and our students have done. Looking at mathematics, following the exact same format, 49% of the students uh, across the state are meeting or exceeding expectations. The year end grade meant about 47%. Notice it is that same 2% differential as compared to ELN. When we look at non meeting expectations, again, we are below the state by 4%. When we look at high needs, 29% of the students across the state are meeting or exceeding. The year end vote tech, that is 39%. I should say plus 10, not plus 9. And when we look at the I mean, it's not meeting across the state, it is 19%. We are at nine. Again, we are below the state by 10%. Low income students, we have been to the Global Tech has 13 percentage points higher, or 13% more kids uh, meeting expectations in low, uh, with low income students. When we look at not meeting expectations, we are below the state by 11%. Students with disabilities in math. We here are actually one percentage point higher than the state. When, it, when we're looking at the not being expectations, we are below the state by 9%. English learners and former English learners, we are below the state by 6% in math. But when we look at the not meeting expectations, we are below the state by 60%. African American students, dead even. In mathematics, when it comes to meeting and exceeding expectations, however, when you look at the not meeting expectations, we are below the state by 2%. Hispanic and Latino students, we are outperforming the state by 18 percentage points when it comes to meeting and exceeding expectations, and the not meeting the opposite of the scale, we are below the state by 13. Again, you will notice not meeting every one of those lines is below the state. Which again is definitely something that we need to recognize uh, and apply. It's great work uh, by our staff and our students. The science test, again, brand new test, new format, new standards. You will notice that across all students, we are all performing the state, meets and exceeds by 4%. High needs, we are all performing the state by 16%. Low income, 18%. Students with disabilities, we are dead even. English learners and former English learners, we are ahead of the state by 4%. African American students, we are ahead of the state by 12%. And Hispanic and Latino students, we are ahead of the state by 25%. Uh, those numbers should not, those percentages should not be taken lightly, obviously. When we look at the not meeting, you will notice that again, every one of those groups, every one of those lines, we are well below the state in the percentage of students that are not meeting expectations. You'll notice the number is ranging from 7% to as high as 29% below the state when it comes to not meeting expectations. We are very pleased with the results that you know we're, we're sharing with you folks. Obviously. Uh, challenging, challenging years with students missing uh, an awful lot of instructional time. But when you look at our school compared to the state, we are doing pretty well. 
If you flip on the next slide, we're looking at student growth. Now, student growth, the format has not changed the way that the Department of Ed calculates student growth. First of all, you'll notice that there were 458. Even though we had almost 100 kids more than that take the test, they are not all reported in student growth. Why not? In order to be reported in student growth, students had to have taken a previous grade test. In this particular case, these students have not taken a test since they were in the seventh grade. So they didn't have a seventh grade NCAT score, they're not included in the student growth. Because what the Department of Ed does is they take what they call academic peers, students that scored alike in the previous grade, and they follow those kids to the 10th grade. And they look at the kids that outperformed their academic peers, some of those kids that underperformed their academic peers, and they give them a range of 1 to 99, 99 being the highest. So you will notice that we tracked it from 2014, and the mean student growth percentile for all students in ELA based on the 458 kids that actually had a score back in seventh grade, we were at 51%. Between 40 and 59 is what they call normal growth. Obviously, the higher on that scale, the better off you are. I compare this with my colleagues to median income, median uh, home prices. You obviously want to be above that 50 line. And we're at 51 for all students in English. When you look at high need students, no student value. And these students, just because they are in a certain subgroup category, doesn't mean that they get. Uh, a different student growth percentile um, applied to them. They still they get compared to every other student. Doesn't matter if your high needs or not. But our high needs students are at the 50 mean student growth percentile, smack in the middle. You flip the page and you look at students with disabilities. They actually grew from 2019. They're for group of students. We got back in 2019, we're at 46.2 uh, mean, mean, uh, mean student. Uh, growth percentile this year 2022 students with disabilities are at 52. African American students also outgrew uh, the African American students across the state. Anytime you see that number of, of 50, that's obviously going to be applauded. African American students are at 59. Now you will notice that that number of African American students looks very low. There are only 35 students there. There were 45 students that actually took the test. 10 of them did not have a score back in the seventh grade. So they could come from a private school. They might have missed the test back in the seventh grade, so they're not included in the seminar. Also, any student who is multiracial is not necessarily counted as African American student. They show up on another chart. And that's why I noticed that that number is, is low. I actually question that number. Went back, looked at a few other sets of data, and the numbers actually exaggerate to what we reported, but that's how they, they come up with that. If you look at Hispanic Latino students, based on 112 students that are in our set of data as um, Hispanic Latino, their mean student growth percentage was 49. Slightly down from 2019. Not a major concern. We obviously want to see that go a little higher, but certainly not a concern. In math, for all students, our students are in the 55th percentile, if you will, for student growth. Again, anything above 50 is something to, to apply. For high need students, at 55, we're actually down a little bit from 2019, from 61. Uh, back in 2019, that student growth percentile of 61.3 was uh, was astronomical. Was a fantastic student growth percentile. 55 is is excellent. It's a very good student growth percentile. Students with disabilities, 53. African American students, a mean student growth percentile of 52. Hispanic Latino students, at 53. So you will notice that every one of these subgroups is either right at the 50th, which is smack in the middle, or actually higher than, than that median point, which again is city-wide. Considering everything that you know we've we've gone through, um, certainly 
it wasn't only our kids agreed with the tech that experienced COVID. Um, we're, we're very pleased with those numbers and everything is here. The annual dropout rate, uh, you may notice that we've actually tracked it uh, even throughout the pandemic. And what's amazing is during the pandemic, the annual dropout rate actually dropped, uh, which is which is very good. We're down to 0.6 percent for an annual dropout rate as of 2021. This is actually one year behind. Uh, because what they do is they include the information that's falling from 2021 into the 2022 report. The 2022 students that graduated with some completing courses, some might have transferred to another district. Those folks, uh, the actual class of 22, will be included in next year's and come with the report. If you flip the page on the next slide, the four year core graduation rate, and basically what the state does is they follow those students from freshman year, they enter our school, we add any student that transfers in, subtract any student that transfers out. The difference from that number of kids that walk in the first day of freshman year to the number of kids who walk across the stage is your graduation rate. We are at 94.8 for. 2021. Again, that lags one year behind, just like the annual dropout rate. You take all the different indicators that the Department of Ed uses performance, growth, graduation, dropout rate, um, percentage of students taking at high level courses, ELL performance on the access test, there are a whole bunch of different indicators. And then the Department of Ed has this wonderful algorithm. They give you a score for each one of those, they add it all up, they line up using the calculation, and you end up with a number of 1 to 99. 99 being the highest performing, 1 being the lowest. When you flip to the next slide, that actually tracks our percentile rate for the entire school since 2014. You will notice that from 2014 to 2017, this is a steady decline from 28 to 24 to 21 uh, over those two years, 2016 and 17, the calculation was actually the same throughout that four-year period. From 2017 to 2018, the Department of Ed actually made an adjustment to the algorithm. That combined with some of the changes we made here at Raymond Death Protect, schedule changes, uh, course changes, course offerings, we spiked from 21 to 61. The following year, we went to the 64th percentile. For the last couple of years, there has not been an accountability report. There has not been a percentile ranking for schools. With a new algorithm for 2022, we are in the 40th percentile. So that gives you a snapshot of where we've been over the past, actually, eight years, but there's only been uh, six years of reporting on the end of the reporting on 2020-2021. That pretty much gives you an idea as to how we did, how our students did in 2020 to uh, again cast as well as the uh, accountability overall based on all the different indicators. Does the committee have any questions? For you, Madam Chair, Mr. Angel, in your absenteeism, you're speaking 18, but is that the 21 22 school year? Or isn't that the 22 23 school year? That would be the year before 21 22. And that's across the state, it's not us here. We're lying. We are. And in some of the conversations we've actually had, we've actually questioned uh, our own absenteeism. Uh, we asked the question of why is it that our kids are. Logging in a lot of absences. What's going on? We did some internal soul searching. And when this report came out from the Department of Ed, we are not unique. We're not, we're not a standout. It's pretty much a phenomenon across, across the state. Okay, why don't we jo jump over to the graphs? Math, why, can you give me any idea why we had such a drop off in math scores? Say it again, a math drop. Math, the ELA, the, every group, the Hispanic, African-American, 
all students, we had a significant drop off in uh, on those charts. Seems like the last few years we've been going up and up and up. Now we've got a significant drop. Are we talking to student growth? Student growth, yes. Student growth. Yep. Let me flip the map here so we can look at each other. So those are actually non significant drops. Um, you notice for all students, we went from 59.9 uh, being student growth. The 55, yes, it is a drop of 4.9 points. Um, what I don't know is how each and every other school has done. Obviously, we know what our school has done. Uh, the Department of Ed has not made the final public. There's a file that the squads and I have looked at over the years. There's an Excel file the Department of Ed puts out, so we're able to look at other schools, look at others that have done. Um, Again, I, I like to use non-educational terms to kind of make a point, make a comparison. So if my salary dropped from 59.9 down to 55, I'd be saying, what's going on? You know, I lost $4,900. But if the average loss was $10,000, I'm doing okay. What I don't know is how does this compare to other schools? That I don't know because they have not shared that file yet. It is something we will look at. As soon as that file is um, made available, I made a couple of calls. The Department of Ed, my calls have not been returned, either because they don't want to talk to me or they're not ready to make that public just yet. But it's something we are going to look at. Mm -hmm. Just another layer to that, just in the world that you live in, Helder. When you make significant growth, the growth beyond that does not look as big. So because we had such a huge growth jump, the next layer of growth doesn't look as big. We're still growing, but it's harder to hit the ceiling when you've already come this far. You don't have much growth left. So th there's a whole calculation that the Department of Ed uses, but it's sometimes easier when you don't make a lot, a lot of growth, because then that jump looks really big the next time. So when you've hit high growth, the, the next level of growth does not look as impressive, but it's still growth. Yeah. Thank you. And I think the other piece is, if we look at that, uh, that actual first slide where I put in changes, keep in mind that what we want to do is we want this information to create a new baseline, which kind of goes back to what this Ben Court is saying. It's, it's not an apples to apples compar a comparison from 2022 back to 2019. We obviously want our kids to grow and perhaps outgrow their counterparts across the state. One, one thing I want to add in to uh, how they're doing a great job is obviously the SGP is something we've been sort of hyper focused on, right? It's the one thing that we can control here, right? Educators can control this. We can't control where a kid's expectation level is when they walk in from eighth grade to ninth grade uh, in any of the subjects, right? So we did great. I'm, I'm happy with where we did. Certainly kids are meeting or partially meeting or exceeding, uh, uh, you know, expectations. We're very happy with those numbers. This is the one piece that we should always be focused on, right? So just as a matter of comparison, only because I've lived in this space, right? When we were in the 59.9 SGP for math, that was in the 88th percentile statewide. So we are outperforming nearly nine out of 10 districts. So this is, this is the wheelhouse. These are the questions I'm pointing at these folks every day. A 55 SGP in math, I don't know that number because they, they haven't reported it yet. Helder has called multiple times, but I'm very confident to tell you that that's north of the 60th, 70th percentile for public high schools. And that's based on my remembering those numbers over the last 10 years. So when you're in this spot, it might look like a decline from as, as Ms. Bencourt mentioned, it's it's a good spot to be in, right? As long as we can say that kids here in math are growing at a rate nearly faster than a quarter, the three quarters or 70% of, of students. And I don't know that to be a fact today, but based upon where those numbers have been, um, we're in that wheelhouse. These SGP numbers are pretty are pretty strong overall for us, um, and certainly numbers we can accept um, in the region, just so the committee members all feel comfortable with that. But I can't wait to look at that. <laughs> and we're calling on the regular. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Well, mostly a comment, too. I, you know, it's hard to look at the graph without the 2020-21 data in there, because, as we know, the last two years have been very difficult. And I just want to... Shout out, that's a very excellent report. I think you put it in terms that we all understand and going forward from here, and also to 
you know, let the staff know that, you know, uh, it's been, it's been tough, but we're, we're, we're in a good place from what I see. And um, I, I think it's all because of the hard work that people have done. So uh, hats off to everybody in this building from you know, teaching assistants and secretaries to teachers to administrators to everybody. So I think we're in, looks good. Thank you for your report. It was a very good report. Appreciate it. Because it's not just the academics, but also the vocational on top of that. It's a huge challenge. One, I think, let's see, shout out by Superintendent Twins. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. So this month, I wanted to kind of highlight in a public fashion the $1.8 million skills capital grant that we received uh, to renovate our HVAC and culinary arts programs. Um, and that comes on the heels of the renovation that we did internally in the cosmetology program. So we're super excited. I'm super proud of the teachers uh, in HVAC and culinary arts, the administrators, some of the district personnel that were involved um, in writing that grant. It was a, a great privilege to be able to go out to the western part of the state with the governor and lieutenant governor to accept that $1.8 million skills capital grant. Um, we're now in the process of starting to design some of those spaces and work with the team. Uh, those projects will be completed in the summer of 2023 and potentially 2024 um, as we move through that process needs to be expended by June 30th of 2024. But it's really exciting and I hope that uh, members of the school community are seeing the investment that the district is making in renovating uh, CVT learning spaces to modernize them for our kids both now and the kids that are coming um, in, down the road. Uh, and so these are just two more projects. We have other um, projects in the works. Um, that we'll be talking more and more about over the coming weeks, some that we're going to do internally, some that we're soliciting outside funds. So just so the committee is aware, um, you know, a year and a half ago, we talked about kind of separating the roles and how the, the school was going to function, right? Mr. Williams and, and Mr. Angelo and Mr. Rebello and the administrative team on the school side is running the day-to-day -day operations of the school. But this would be an example of some of the hard-fought work that folks um, on the district side have gone to try to get the resources that we need uh, from different sources to be able to fund some of these renovations for this institution. So I just want to th say thank you to the teachers and the administrators for their work on the team and to thank those folks on, on the district team who are involved in writing that grant. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to, to take some of that funding and, and really apply it to our programming. Um, moving on to uh, parent communication, Mr. Watson. Yep, so in your packet, you'll see the POSIP reports from uh, the last two weeks. Um, so we're noticing a slight uptick, which is a good thing in, in parent involvement. Uh, nearly 25 or 26% of our parents in the first survey re responded. That number didn't drop in the second one, but the uh, Family Engagement Center is returning calls, uh, comments, and questions uh, in very short order. So these reports come in on, on a Friday. It's completed over the weekend. We get a Monday or Tuesday, and then that week, the Family Engagement folks are contacting any parent who's listed a question, has a concern, we're directing to the appropriate academy or department to be able to answer those questions. I um, mean, we're hopeful that by being ultra responsive to the comments and things that are coming in, that we'll be encouraging people to give us their feedback, um, you know, more regularly. Certainly getting feedback and people doing surveys, I know I'll speak for myself, I'm not great at it either, so I'm sure our parents and family members don't love get those emails, but uh, we do appreciate that feedback and we want to make sure that when people do tell us something, that we are responding um, quickly to those questions. Okay. Um, um, the Arlington report, please, Mr. Uh, Principal Milliers. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. I'll present uh, the October 2022 RSM report. First, I want to talk about the assistant principal and the security team and the work that they've been doing. It's been a busy start in our second month of school. During the first week of school, the security team, as well as the assistant principals and Officer Fisher, our school resource officer, uh, presented eight class meetings. They covered a list of topics which included school policy, um, suspensions, expulsions, bus expectations, parking lot expectation, appropriate use of technology. Bullying and Alice procedure. In addition, the team held a bus driver training where all of the students were checked, given general training information, and had questions answered for the upcoming school year. Next, we have to provide them with a breakfast to keep them all happy. <laughs> team also conducted a rear door bus evacuation drill where students 
trained on how to leave an access country safely in the event of a bus emergency. Lastly, the security team conducted an after school staff Alice training session in preparation for our whole school live drill, which will be October 21st. Math department led by Greg Haley. Um, we'd like to welcome Mr. Rocha, Julie Newman, and George DeRoja to the math department. William Rocha worked for GMBBT Broke Tech last year on a one year contract and has prior experience at Reparation and Farmington High. Julie spent multiple years at Dartmouth High and Durfee High in the math and special ed department. And George, who previously worked for Volk Tech for 13 years, returns to GMBVT Volk Tech after a period of teaching in Florida. This is actually my teacher's name. The math department is working diligently to plan and deliver rigorous and engaging instruction. 23 juniors and two seniors will be taking the math, the MCAS math retest on November 15th and 16th. The academic support program is offering tutoring after school in addition specific subjects for tutoring algebra one algebra two and geometry are also available the english department led by susan sylvia is scheduled to spend some focused time during plc meetings throughout the year to review 2022 ela mcas star reading pre-assessment and writing pre-assessment data to determine the lingering impact of the pandemic on student learning skills and to discuss targeted instruction for low performance areas. Teachers will also discuss topics such as common formative assessments, revising the department's ELA mock MCAS test for grade 10 students, and curriculum unit guide revisions. On to Academy B, led by Joanne Romanelli, to the Culinary Arts Program. Trash fish to cash fish, how to better use the local ecosystems for a more sustainable and affordable seafood menu is what Joanne O'Neill, Henry Bousquet, and Robert Wilkinson, and Christine Silva toured on a field trip to the New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center, in which they, they participated in a grant program designed to market local sustainable seafood program. The instructors participated in a field trip beginning at the auction, uh, they learned about the process of unloading the fishing vessels, tagging and packaging of the products, and grading the seafood and getting it ready for auction. They had the opportunity to sit in during live auction and watch the process right downtown. It's a pretty awesome experience for our culinary students. Moving on to the slide thereafter. Let's skip that one. Our dental assisting students, 100% of our dental assisting students, dental assistant students, are currently on co-op at various local dental offices. Senior students are planning and are to attend the Yankee Dental Company January 26th. Early Childhood Education. As part of the Early Childhood Education and Teaching Program, the students are exploring cultural responsiveness through quality literature. They are delighted that Horace Mann, a fully funded project from donors, donors choose titled Literacy for Life that adds diverse titles to the children's library for use in their curriculum development coursework, in addition to reflecting to students and families in their program. Moving on to the Legal and Protective. At the end of last year, the Legal and Protective Service sophomores, 32 of them earned the CERT, which is a Citizens Emergency Response Team certification. They also, they were also scheduled to earn their emergency shelter certification with MEMA and New Bedford Emergency Management. Additionally, the senior students completed the Massachusetts State Public Safety Telecommunicator 1 and APCO PST 1 certification. This certification took place over four cycles. The graduated legal students were then state certified E911 dispatchers. Great experience for these kids, great service. Medical assistant. As of this cycle, 25 of the 20 seniors are currently on co-op at local medical offices. I'm sure you've probably seen them around at medical offices. They're everywhere. The three remaining students will have co-op positions within the next few cycles. The sophomore students, 28 out of 31, are eligible, have once again started their placement experience in the nurse's office in, in the Bedford and Dartmouth public school system. This placement program has been placed COVID, which is now up and running, which is great for them. The nurse assisting, 100%, 26 seniors, 
that signed up, passed their certified nurse assistant certification examination at these seniors. 100%, which is 21 of all seniors, this will be on the floor after cycle five. So many great things going on throughout our school. That's just a tidbit of them from our security office, our security, math, and academy B. Thank you. Folks, the report. Yeah. Also, co-op piece kind of yeah. not just out of books, but the real world. Um, let's see, superintendent's weekly updates. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. Uh, so, in the packet, basically, these are the weekly newsletters. Uh, they're going out every Monday. This week, Tuesday, on the first day. Early in the morning, that way uh, folks have it at the top of their email boxes when they arrive. Um, so you're welcome to take a look at them. I just want to continue to give them every month so that you know what I'm, we're communicating out to the team. Uh, so next we have um, Gonzales, the, the student report, something we all look forward to. Awesome. How do you guys even say it? So first I want to highlight the student advisory committee. So the student advisory committee has been launched and the students representing each grade level have been chosen. So choose these students, what we did was we sent out a form and students had to an answer three simple questions on how they would be able to contribute to the superintendent uh, student advisory committee. And the idea of this committee was found when um, Mr. Well, not Mr. Superintendent Watson found that he had a gap, a disconnect between the students. So he wanted to fill that in. So Sarah Lowe's actually an alumni here. She used to be the student rep, came up with the idea to do this. And her seat had been flourishing already. We already got a team of four students from each grade, and we have our first meeting on Monday. So which is luck. Um, we hope that it's very productive. You don't need any luck. It's with me, Elijah. You'll be fine. You know what I mean? It's no problem. <laughs> Next, I want to highlight uh, the student council. So the student council has had a meeting uh, going over the plan of homecoming and the parent running. So this Thursday, we'll be meeting with Mr. Matthew the students to confirm some details so that we can be on the same page. For homecoming, the theme is a Halloween bash. It will be held on October. 29 and students can wear a costume if they would like to. Um, there will also be a costume contest as well. And the pep rally, the goal of the pep rally this year is to be more inclusive. We noticed that over the years, right, we had um, one single activity that students were involved in, but not many students enjoyed, right? Not many students could um, take, um, participate in that activity. So this year, we're going to try something different. When we meet with Mr. Mendia, we're going to propose to him the idea of having five separate activities so that we can have an opportunity for all students to get involved. And after that, I want to highlight a student from Skills USA. So, Junior Jordan Mello, a part of the Marine Science Technology Program, is the State and Region 1 Vice President of Skills USA. So, Skills USA is built up with different chapters in each school. So, for example, we have a chapter in this school, and within the state of Massachusetts, it's its own chapter. So, he is the Vice President of that chapter. So from September 16th to the 21st, he had the opportunity to travel with the other eight members of the Skills USA Massachusetts State Executive Council to Washington, D.C., to the Washington Leadership Training Institute. This institute brings together all the Skills USA state officers from across the country. At the program, Jordan Mello attended advanced trainings on professionalism, communication, and leadership skills. Some of the activities included calm, calm congressional visits, tours of Washington, D.C., and the monument slain of a week of a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier, and more. So let's take a moment to also thank the Skills USA advisors, um, Mrs. Megan Lacasse and Mrs. Lori Russell for losing. Because of their leadership, students like Jordan are able to have many opportunities and to grow and pave their way to success. I also want to highlight BPA. So the BPA officers will be traveling on November 3rd to the BPA Fall Leadership Conference. The event will be hosted at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester. And at this time right now, students are getting ready to compete in the state leadership conference that will take place from March 4th to March 5th. The goal is to place in states to earn a seat at the National Leadership Conference that will be held in Anaheim, California from April 26th to 30th. And the theme of BPA this year is discover your burdens. I also want to highlight my favorite, um, my favorite English semester, the Vogue Tech Theater Company. So this past Saturday, the Vogue Tech Theater Company had their fall car wash. And the company hosts three fundraisers a year 
to support the cause of sense, drugs, costumes, legal rights, and all the factors that go into supporting the production financially. And I brought my car to the car wash, right? And they had energy, man. They were dancing, they had the signs of pride. And I was like, you know what? Let me hop up, let me help them. So it was a good time. Um, and I also want to highlight a student, a part of um, our school community. She's an 11th grade student. Her name is Angelie Samito. And I also want to highlight another student named Gabriela Javier Gonzalez. And these two students were under the guidance of um, our teacher, who's in the room right now, Mrs. Flynn. She's a science teacher here at Great American Book Ten. And they were recognized as honorees in the 10th annual Cool Science Extreme Render Art Competition. So on September 16th, there was an award ceremony at UMass Lowell to recognize all the contest winners and runners from the various grade levels. At this contest, students had to create a poster along with an artist statement addressing one of the three prompts on the impacts of extreme weather events in our future. And Ms. Lynch wrote that Angelie received Cool Sciences Top Award named in memory of David Lucistic, a former school of education professor and co-founder of the project. Their artwork they submitted while in 10th grade answered the prompt, well, I want to teach others about extreme weather and climate. Angelie's network from their poster will be featured on the WRTA buses this fall. So basically what that is, is on the bus, you know how they have the different advertisements. So their poster is going to be on that. It's a pretty cool accomplishment. And Gabriella was recognized as a runner-up for her artwork that answered from how will our lives change and whether it becomes more severe. And Ms. Lynch also said that she can be more proud of their efforts and was happy to be their mentor through the process. And I also want to highlight a new student-led club here called the Christian Students Club. Today, the Christian Students Club had their first meeting. The Christian Students Club is a student-led club where students can come together and express their faith and grow while creating meaningful friendships. Today, there was a great turnout of 12 students, and I have the privilege of being the student leader of this um, club along with some awesome friends, and we hope that this club can spark something really great in our school. And that is the conclusion of my super report. Any uh, questions? I don't said any conclusions, any questions. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Shea? I'm doing very well, thank you. Again, as always, a good report. Um, just a suggestion here. Uh, one, the report that you gave with the artists with the uh, bulletin boards or whatever, you know, I know if, I might be opening up Pandora's box here to, to create things, but I think if anything at that level gets recognized, I'd love to have the teacher and the students come before us in that month right previous or after. We, I would love to see what they did. Yeah. And talk to students about how why they did that. I I think that's excellent to hear from a student to right. us on what the students are doing. But now let's bring the students there. So if that's possible yeah. down the future, and even if they've done it already, I maybe can come at the next meeting sure. to present what they've done and have a, a, a student recognition center type thing. Perfect. Thank you, sir. That's a great idea. Thank Am you. I love to bring guests to the community meetings. <laughs> Through him. <laughs> now we might be opening up a Pandora's box. Oh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> nice job. Maybe guest. We'll, so we'll start there. Let's see what we can do. Get a plus one. <laughs> so we're, we'll uh, take a breath in between. We're going to uh, do business. Uh, we'd like to vote um, to approve the student activities. Account balances as of uh, September 30th. And we have something in our packet to show that. Do I have any uh, discussion on that? A motion we approve no. as presented. Quick, I have a discussion first. No, motion, Wait, motion first. All right. Oh, second. <laughs> Who's doing what here? Show <laughs> <laughs> me and Mr. Kane. You said one quick question. Um, What's the student um, miscellaneous account? What is what is that? That has been on this list since before I even started in the district, and that has just been there. I don't know where it came from. It has not been added to, so I don't know how it started. It's just been sitting there. It could be a miscellaneous deposit that somebody didn't bring in their paperwork to put it in their correct line item. So it was sitting there until they came to say, hey, my balance isn't correct. But since I've been with the district, I haven't had anybody come to me saying my balance isn't correct. So, so is that free money for one of us over here? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the student activity, so it has to go to the students. Well, yes. So what oh. happened to it in that case, ma'am? That's just a quick question. So it could have been, as Mr. Watt just said, that could have been that a club closed and the funds sat there and now it just got moved into this miscellaneous because they didn't decide to donate it to another club 
or they didn't do anything with their end funding. Well, we're gonna. What we'll do, Mrs. Ribeiro, is um, you know I don't want to hold this up if, it, if the committee's on board. But what we'll do is take a look at what that balance has been over the last several years and see if we can identify is it a stagnant balance, is it a balance that's been added to it. So uh, Pam and I will work on what that balance is. Report back to you on it. I think that's probably the best way. And then we figure out if it is a stagnant balance, what can we do with those funds um, at this point, right? It's no problem funneling into a student activity, right? I'm sure, I can talk with Elijah and he'll find a way to help us. Sure. We'll find a way to do it. So uh, why don't we find out first if it's been a stagnant balance for a period of time? And my, my hunch is it probably has been. It has interest added to it, just like all of the accounts that have a, a balance. They have uh, interest added to it each month. But there is no activity of being deposited because everyone that brings in their deposit, it goes with their correct student activity account. We'll take a look at what our options are and we'll report back. They have asked before when I first started, they had asked what it was. And again, at that time, I couldn't answer either because I had just started and I had no backup as to why it was deposited into this miscellaneous line. But because there's no growth and there hasn't been any action to give it to another student activity, they've been fine with it being in the miscellaneous category until something has been decided upon. Motion. Sorry. 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 What we we're going to vote on all of these. My question was, are all these active? If they're not active, maybe we should be voting for the active membership rather than keep voting for something that you know doesn't exist anymore. I think part of that answer, I think I can give to what I remember about the miscellaneous is exactly then what you were saying is that sometimes when things you know ended, what do you do with it? I think that might be something that this committee want to look at because as our student rep talked about, you know, I, I'm big on Skills USA and I'm on BPA, and there's a lot of other things happening now that I, I'm learning about. And there's a lot of times of maybe percentage of that going to those kids at the end of the year, senior prom, which I think is, you know, every student gets to participate in. So, but I, I think I'm going to vote for this, but I, I think it'd be nice to know out of those 32 or whatever they are, yes, they're all active, or 8, 10, 12 are not active. We, we know what we're voting for, I think. That's my answer. Well, uh, to clarify too, the very last one should say the class of 2026 for the in new freshman class, not 2023. That class is listed twice. So the very last one that has a zero dollar amount, since the freshman class hasn't done any fundraising yet, it should say 2026. But uh, Mr. Shea and Mrs. Ribeiro's comment, uh, Maria, if we can make a note of that, and we'll prepare Pam a report for the committee next month that outlines all of the accounts. Um, and if we find there are dormant accounts, we'll we'll propose a series of recommendations for you to be able to act on. Thank you. So, do I have a motion? I think I had a motion. A motion is second. Okay. Do a discussion. Sorry. All in favor? Thank you. Hey, Mr. Shea just messed me up. <laughs> <laughs> And then let's see, moving on to um, to accept the donation made by the Northwest Atlantic Sea Scallop Fisheries. Yeah. I'm about to accept the donation. Second. All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Vote to approve uh, state travel for student athletes. The girls' volleyball coach is requesting for permission for the team to travel to Providence College on October 22nd. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? New cafeteria salary scale included in our packet is a copy of proposed LPN salary scale also for no cafeteria. Um, any uh, motion on this, folks? Motion to uh, support the vote. Second. Question. Question. Through you to uh, PM. Yes. Yeah. Um, are, are these are these mounts in line with the, the, the other districts cafeterias in our districts sending schools? 
at this time, we didn't align the entire scale. All we did was take step one and bring it up to the $15 mark. That will be the new minimum wage as of January 1. But the rest of the scale stayed the exact same. Okay, so All we changed was just that one step. So we don't know where we stand. Uh, no, we're going to evaluate that after all of the other union contracts are done. Then we're going to um, evaluate the um, the salary chart of the. Um, one of the things, uh, the, the cafeteria people aren't in one of the unions. Are they? No, they are not in a union. Mr. Durgan's point, um, what we're asking tonight is for you to make sure that we're prepared at the minimum wage hike on our scale. But I fully envision us bringing uh, an additional amendment to this before you, um, before the end of 2022 and ahead of this, but this is just to make sure that we've started the process and that we're in compliance with the law. Um, and as I mentioned, um, as we wrap the, the end of these last contracts, we'll, we'll be coming back with an adjustment here as well. So all in favor, please. Aye. Vote to designate equipment and surplus. We have uh, the backup material in our packet. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Questions, folks? Okay. Vote to create a CVTE shop revolving funds, including in your backup, backup copy is a request to create the CVTE shop revolving funds. Can explain what that is? We have revolving funds for um, our CBTE areas that have the ability to bring in revenue for their shop area. For example, culinary, automotive, um, and working with Mrs. Ravello, we realized that the rest of these that have the opportunity to bring in revenue do not have their own revolving fund. Um, so we wanted to create these revolving funds for collision, diesel, marine, machine technology, and metal fabrication, so that if the students were to do any work for anybody on the outside, that whatever... Um, the price free price fee uh, list could be that those funds would be placed into these revolving funds for the students to then turn around and use towards other equipment that can't be supported by the budget. I'll make a motion to uh, support the revolving funds. Second. All in favor? Whoops, got questions. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Carmel. Pam, do we have one for Cosmo? Yes. Yes. And Cosmo and already has. Did they already have one? Uh, so, yes. Oh, Cosmo's had one for a very long time. I just wanted to make sure that the change is in place. Yes. Okay. So, um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, report on personnel appointments, retirements, resignations um, to be placed on file. So, see if I'm placed on file. Yeah. Um, all of these. Any Any National Honor Society. Motion received, placed on file. We have a motion, a second, please. Second. One favor. Second. Any opposed? Um, any discussion at this time? I did want to just bring up, I know we had talked at the last meeting about creating a subcommittee to look at the um, admissions data that's come in. I think we need to revisit that if anybody wants to um, open up discussion. No, I, I think the policies have four members. You know, usually 
one developer, one Dharma, two from FAA because we have eight members. But really, we only have seven members because the eighth person has not been appointed. So you have to look at the seven, and now we have to go down to three. And I think one of the things that we're looking at right now is to re re review the information on the supplement of students coming in. In the last meeting, I know there were uh, two new graphic people, a behave and a doctor person. So we have to decrease that to three. I think the best way to do it is we have a document representative as a chair. And I, I know that chair is in contact with Mr. Watson, you know, constantly and, and knows kind of oversees all the other things going on. So I feel it's best that I would remove myself from that subcommittee so that that you would have two new Baptist people. Again, the person that I think is looking as a direction did not vote for the last year, but she has thoughts. We have a, you know, a reader representing minority and then we have behavior representing. So I would remove myself if that's okay with the committee and you have your three members to continue. Concerns, comments. So that was <laughs> the Miles spent for and that quick update, Dr. Mylan. So Maria is going to reach out to the three of you uh, tomorrow, uh, see if we can't establish a meeting time in the next week or so. Um, you know, as in the paper, right? The admissions policies are now due. October 1st to the state, um, I spent the better part of the last half of the summer communicating with those folks is that that's also the date the student information management system reports, keep them from what's I do uh, to the state. So I'm hoping that there'll be some longer term look at that because uh, October 1 attestation at the same time that the data is due doesn't really give us time for a thoughtful review. Long story short, in September, they did grant my request to have uh, our submission uh, extended. Um, I submitted a date promising to have all materials, including the new policy, to them by November 10th of 2022, and that would mean it would be before you at our November 8th meeting. So we have about four weeks to review that data, um, consider um, what we're going to do with a, a policy for the class of 2027, get that in draft form, and back before the committee um, at the November session. Just a timeline for the, for the rest of the members. Um, okay, uh, business that uh, may properly come before us. None, seeing none. Um, the committee will be adjourning to executive session under chapter 30, section 21, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Teamsters Union, local 59, as the chair. Um, has determined that this open meeting <coughs> would have a effect on the bargaining positions of the committee that the members will not be returning to the session. Okay, roll call. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you very much, folks.